Hi everybody, and welcome back to Philosophy of Cognitive Science with me, Dr. Josh Redstone. Today's lecture is entitled, after the book chapter in Clark, Perception, Action, and the Brain. During this lecture, the first part of my lecture on perception, action, and the brain, we're going to be sticking to the sketches section, as we usually do. Just a quick recap. You remember last time we completed our discussion of connectionism and artificial neural networks, at least our discussion of the chapter on connectionism and artificial neural networks. We will continue encountering some of the interesting ideas we covered last time and the lecture before that throughout the course, as we will with many of the different themes and ideas we've encountered so far. Um, in particular, you'll recall last time we discussed concerns with artificial neural networks, concerns about mental causation, for example, concerns about systematicity, and concerns about biological plausibility. So if you need a quick refresher, uh, go back and rewatch that previous lecture. That previous lecture and the one previous to that were much different than the materials we've covered so far, as you know. We've covered symbol systems to a much greater extent than we have connectionism. But as I mentioned, not to worry, we will re-encounter connectionism as we proceed through the course, including in today's lecture, in fact. So that's what we covered last time, concerns about mental causation, systematicity, and biological plausibility. So today we're going to get started with some levels talk. Um, you will remember that throughout the course so far, I've talked about different levels of analysis, I've talked a little bit about levels of functional organization, but I've talked about these things in a sort of um, breadcrumb dropping fashion, where I only mention um, I only mention them in passing without going into too much detail. We are going to go into this in some detail today when we talk about perception, action, and the brain, and we're going to start with the work of David Marr. Now, David Marr was a computational neuroscientist who uh, wrote a very influential book called Vision, um, or I believe uh, the full title was A Computational Account of Vision. Um, in any case, this was a very influential book published in the early 80s. It was influential because Marr, who was a computational neuroscientist, offered many interesting insights about how the human visual system works. Uh, as an information processor, he gave a computational account of vision, after all. Um, but perhaps what he's uh, become to be, uh, perhaps what he's come to be even more well known for, um, is his tri-level hypothesis, or his three levels of analysis, or more specifically of task analysis. Although it's really only the first level that's a level of task analysis. In any way, or in any case, I should say, excuse me. You know what? We need some more coffee before we get into our levels talk. So Marr was interested in understanding how the human visual system worked, and um, he distinguished between three different levels of explanation. Now keep in mind, when we talk about levels of explanation, we're not always talking about the same thing as levels of organization, functional organization in the mind. So keep that in mind. Uh, when we talk about levels of explanation or levels of analysis, <clears throat> these do not always map cleanly onto levels of organization in the mind. And we'll see this as we proceed through, <clears throat> excuse me, some of Marr's ideas today. So, Marr has these three levels. He has the computational level, the algorithmic level, and the implementational level. So why don't we take a look at what each of those levels are, what we do at each of those levels of analysis, and uh, along the way, we'll discuss why Marr decided to do this, why he decided to conceive of this approach. So the computational level is, as I mentioned earlier, the level of task analysis. This is a high level of analysis of cognitive systems, mental systems, computational systems, whatever you want to call them. This is an abstract uh, high-level analysis of what the system we're looking at is supposed to do. So when we are engaging in task analysis at the computational level, what we're doing is analy analyzing in very general terms the computational task that the system we're interested in 
is performing. So we want to start with a, just a very general description of the system and uh, develop a rough account, a sort of a sketch, if you like, of um, what the information processing task is that the system is trying to solve. Okay, so um, we don't just want to do that, by the way. We also want to identify constraints upon the solutions to the information processing task or to the inputs, you know, uh, that the system can, uh, can receive. So we don't just need to look at the task and what the task is. We also need to think about what the inputs are, what the outputs will be, uh, that kind of thing. Uh, so to put it very simply, what we're doing at the computational level of analysis is trying to work out what the cognitive system or computational system is supposed to be doing. What, what does it do? What are its inputs? And what are its outputs? And if you're worried about you know, concrete examples, don't worry. We're going to cover a few of them. We'll get the abstract stuff out of the way first before I give you examples of each kind of analysis uh, in concrete form. So moving on from the computational level, we're going down. Uh, down uh, in terms of uh, abstraction. We're going from the computational level of analysis, which is very abstract, uh, to the next level, the algorithmic level, which is less abstract. So what do we do at the algorithmic level of analysis? Well, we have started with a task description of our computational system. We've already got that out of the way. So we've specified the task, we know what our inputs and outputs are, perhaps they're symbols, numbers, whatever. So now we want to know how is the task that we've specified at the computational level of analysis solved? Well, that's what we do at the algorithmic level. We try to give an algorithmic account of how the system we're looking at takes those inputs and transforms them into outputs. So how does that happen? We need to explain that by specifying the uh, necessary steps in this causal chain that transforms the inputs to outputs. We need a series of steps uh, that are given in a definite and circumscribed way, like a set of instructions, an algorithm, a computer program, right? We generate the algorithm that captures how the information processing actually takes place, how the system actually does what it does. So, what we're asking here um, is, and this might seem a little bit confusing, but what we're really asking is how uh, the system computes the task that we've described at the computational level. I say that might be a bit confusing because the previous, more abstract level is the computational level of analysis, but this is what we're doing. Uh, at the level of computation or task analysis, we're simply describing the computation. At the algorithmic level, we are trying to come up with an account, a, a, a definite and circumscribed set of instructions or an algorithm or set of algorithms that describes how the system takes the inputs and transforms them into outputs. Now we come to the most fundamental of Mars levels. This is the implementational level. The implementational level is where we try to determine how the algorithm or algorithms that we've identified at the previous level are physically realized, how they are physically implemented. What kind of stuff are we using to realize or implement the computational representational states of the system? How do we realize the algorithm? How do we build a system that computes according to the algorithm we've identified at the previous level in order to complete the task that we've identified at the highest level. So um, we're trying to identify physical mechanisms at this level, the physical mechanisms that do all of that stuff I just said, that compute the algorithm which gets our task done. So remember, um, these are levels of analysis. If we want to understand a cognitive system or a computational system, we should uh, try and do it, Marr thought, in a top-down way. And this is what Marr did for studying the human visual system. And this is the first example I have on the slides to illustrate how we apply the tri-level hypothesis. So 
Marr, as I mentioned, was a computational neuroscientist, and he studied uh, vision. Specifically, he, he focuses on the early visual system in his book, uh, Vision. So, Marr says to himself, well, <laughs> not in these exact words, but Marr might have uh, said something to himself or thought something to himself along the lines of, well, I'm a neuroscientist, but I need to understand just what the computational task of the early visual system is, then I can give an algorithmic account of it, and then I can work out the implementational details. So what Marr did is look at the human visual system, the early visual system, which starts with the eyes. You have information coming in, and it hits your retina, hits the retina, which is on the back of the eye, and information travels down the optic nerves to the visual cortex on, well, if you were to, if you could see inside my head, my visual cortex would be here in the occipital lobe. So, um, the, uh, the important thing is a few implementational details before we get started. Information, uh, visual information from the left side of space travels down the optic nerves to the right occipital lobe, and information from the right side of space travels down the optic nerves to the left uh, occipital lobe. So, uh, this is called uh, the contralateral organization of the visual system. And a very important point, uh, it's, not, it's not as simple as the input from the right eye goes to the left visual cortex and vice versa. No, it's sides of space, not the eyes. So, information from the right side of my visual field in both eyes is routed to the early visual system on the left side of my brain, and vice versa. Uh, so those are some implementational details. We understood this uh, when Mars was studying vision, but Mar wanted to kind of take things a step further. So he says to himself, I need to understand what the task of the visual system is. Obviously, information is coming in. Uh, it's a 2D image on the back of the retina, which is then, uh, that information is then carried uh, to the visual cortex. And eventually, what the human visual system does is create from this two-dimensional image that's projected through the eye onto the, onto the retina in the back of the eye. The purpose of vision is to take that 2D information and to turn it into a three-dimensional representation of the world. So that is what Marr essentially did uh, with human vision. He started at the top at the highest level of abstraction, at the computational level of analysis, and he said, well, the purpose of vision, the task of vision, is to take two-dimensional information from the retina, which of course comes from uh, light coming in through the eyes and shining on the back of the retina. The purpose is to take that information and somehow, in the visual cortex, render a three-dimensional viewer independent representation of the scene. Um, so, having identified the task of vision, Marr proceeds to the algorithmic level. Marr outlines a series of steps uh, that we're not going to get into in too much detail that basically take um, 2D inputs from the retina, which are very basic, uh, very basic kinds of representation like um, points and lines and zero crossings and uh, very basic information, and uh, then computing what he called a 2.5D sketch. So we go from a 2D sketch to a 2.5D sketch, finally to a three-dimensional sketch, uh, which is the um, viewer-dependent uh, viewer, uh, viewer representation or object-independent representation. This is the representation that allows me to uh, consistently perceive the world, uh, you know, all the objects are, at least in my visual representation of the world, uh, everything seems to be richly detailed. And when I move my head, I don't have the sensation that objects are moving or that the world is moving. Uh, I understand that I'm moving and my visual representation seems stable. Uh, so that's the, in very brief form, the algorithmic account of vision. Um, that Marr came up with. Then, now having laid all of this out, Marr can proceed to the implementational details. 
which in this case would be uh, neurons in the optic nerves, uh, different areas of the visual cortex, and so on and so forth. So that is how Marr applied this approach to human vision, but we can apply it to other uh, devices uh, and systems as well. For example, um, I like to use the example of a pocket calculator because it's fairly straightforward. What is the computational task of a pocket calculator? Well, I suppose we could characterize it in terms of uh, taking uh, certain digits as inputs and computing mathematical functions like addition, subtraction, division, and multiplication, and then outputting the, the sums, products, differences, so forth for those functions. Uh, the algorithmic account of a pocket calculator would be the actual steps in the calculations uh, that it can uh, apply to these inputs and outputs. And uh, an implementational analysis of the pocket calculator would tell us about how all of this is physically realized, perhaps with wires, uh, circuits, silicon chips, and the like. Uh, similarly, we could apply this to a digital computer, and, and uh, you know, a, a digital computer like this one right here. And it would probably seem very similar to a calculator, except uh, much more universal. Indeed, we could think of a a pocket calculator is perhaps a uh, special purpose Turing machine, and if the church Turing thesis is correct, then a personal computer like this one uh, would be a universal Turing machine. So the inputs uh, generated here, or the inputs used here, would be, well, strings of uh, ones and zeros, ultimately, which represent certain basic uh, logic functions, which can be strung together uh, to compute more complicated functions. Uh, if we talked about how this is done algorithmically, well, uh, that would give us something like um, something like a high level computer code description of whatever program that the computer is carrying out. And if we wanted to talk about the implementational details, it would be a lot like a, uh, a lot like the case of the pocket calculator. We've got circuits, we've got wires and chips and uh, the physical stuff which we implement the algorithm on, which is how the computational task we've identified is carried out. So, um, those are Mars levels, and uh, this is often called a top-down approach to studying the mind. This will be important to keep in mind. It's top-down because we start from a high level of abstraction, and we go uh, down, uh, as we go down, things get more concrete. We go from an abstract description of the computational task to an algorithmic account of how the task is carried out to a description of its, uh, the system's physical implementation or how the system is physically realized. But speaking of realizing things, Mars levels remind us of machine functionalism. And while Mars levels have been helpful in the cognitive sciences, uh, they've also maybe been a bit of a hindrance. So we're going to talk about why that is and why I just brought up functionalism now. So recall our discussion from previous lectures of machine functionalism. Machine functionalism is an idea uh, that we get from Hilary Putnam, and he um, developed this idea um, thanks, I believe, in part to the work of Turing and other figures and even earlier work of logicians, um, you know, the, the logics that we covered that um, uh, serve as sort of like a part of the prehistory of cognitive science. Uh, in any case, I don't want to get into a big digression about machine functionalism, but the point of machine functionalism, if you recall, is that we can understand minds in terms of... Uh, their functions, their functional states, not how they're physically realized. And before, uh, I used the example of a heart to illustrate this. This is an example I use in another class as well sometimes, but what is it that makes a heart a heart? If you're a functionalist, you would say that what makes a heart a heart is that it pumps blood. It pumps deoxygenated blood to the lungs to be reoxygenated, and it circulates that blood throughout the body and then it goes back to the heart and back to the lungs and so on and so on. So the purpose of the heart is to pump blood so that it can be oxygenated and so that it can circulate to all of your cells. Uh, now, there are many different types of hearts out there in the biological world. 
Uh, large whales, for example, have huge hearts. Um, fish and reptiles have hearts with a different number of chambers than mammalian hearts. Uh, there are now artificial hearts uh, that people might receive if they need a heart transplant and a biological heart is not available. Perhaps they'll use a, uh, an artificial heart of some kind. And, um, well, I guess that would technically make them a cyborg, wouldn't it? In any case, the point is what makes a heart a heart is not what it's made of, but what it does, what its function is. Same with minds on machine functionalism. And a lot of people took this as a license to ignore the messy biological details, ignore whatever's going on in the brain. We don't need to worry about that. What matters are the functional computational states, right? So that's machine functionalism. And Mars' tri-level hypothesis has kind of had a similar effect. Perhaps it has even combined with the effect of machine functionalism to make it seem as though we don't need to focus on the implementational details too closely. Indeed, um, although Marr was uh, well-versed in the implementational details, he was trying to emphasize the importance of algorithmic and computational descriptions uh, for neuroscientific explanations of uh, cognitive processes and perceptual processes. A lot of his uh, colleagues maybe would just be concerned about the implementational details, but Marr thought that higher level, more abstract uh, descriptions uh, would be helpful for these researchers. But a lot of cognitive scientists have perhaps uh, taken this as license not to worry about the implementational details. Uh, their focus is on a description of uh, the computational task, perhaps, and uh, on an algorithmic account of how that task is carried out. All this is to say is that Mars levels of analysis have been massively influential within the cognitive sciences, but his account is just a little too neat. Um, as we're going to see, the distinction between these levels of analysis is not always very clear, and it's also not always clear how neatly these levels map onto actual levels of functional organization in cognitive systems. We'll see that as we proceed through this lecture. Of course, um, we've also talked about uh, how we should not ignore the implementational details in this class before, and we'll talk about that a little bit more today. Um, rather, uh, rather than taking functionalism or Mars levels as license to ignore the implementational details, um, what Clark thinks should happen, and I'm very much in this camp, I think, along with Clark, um, is that Information processing models, the kind of thing we do at the computational and algorithmic level of, levels of analysis, and um, implementational models, or neurophysiological models, the kind of thing we do at the implementational level, need to co-evolve together and inform one another as research into these cognitive systems unfolds. Now, Marr was right about one thing, though, if he was right about anything, and he was right about many things. But one thing he was very right about was that mere implementational details are not enough to understand the mind. So we do need to reach for those higher levels of understanding. I'm, again, I'm saying higher levels in terms of abstraction, right? The computational level of analysis gives us a more abstract description than does the algorithmic level of analysis, and so on and so forth. And we need these higher level descriptions of minds in order to really understand what they do if cognition and mentation is truly computation, right? If you remember uh, the computationalism from, from some of our earlier lectures. So Clark quotes this interesting example from Cantwell Smith in his book. Uh, just go back to our personal computer example, right? Imagine that you had a PC that was running uh, a program for doing your income taxes, right? Now, um, if you wanted to, you could just describe what, uh, whatever the uh, computer is doing with that program in terms of circuits uh, being on or off. Uh, you could talk about the machine code if you wanted to. You could talk about the implementational details exclusively, but that would not really give you a good idea of what the program is actually doing or how it works, you know? How would you know this is a uh, 
uh, a tax filing program just from this implementation level description? You wouldn't. How would you know how it works? You wouldn't. You wouldn't uh, you would start to lose your semantic transparency, I guess is what I'm saying, by focusing exclusively, exclusively on the implementational level. So we need higher level um, descriptions of how this program works, right? We need information processing or computational or algorithmic descriptions. The kinds of things we would get if we could look at the actual, um, you know, higher level code of the program. Perhaps the program is written in Python or, or something like that. I actually don't know uh, very much about actual computer codes. Uh, I'm really more theoretical, uh, theory-oriented when it comes to this stuff. But an algorithmic description might give you the kind of thing that you could read out of uh, a higher level, more abstract computer code like Python or Java or... Um, uh, what's what's the other one? Oh, C sharp. Uh, lots of different codes that are higher level and are semantically transparent. So we need these. Um, but and here's the catch: implementational level descriptions can also help to inform these higher level descriptions. It's just uh, I guess the issue here is that neither the information processing story or the implementational story is the full story, right? As Clark said, as I said on the previous slide, slide seven, uh, we really need these two approaches to work together, to co-evolve together. Otherwise, um, we're, uh, we're not going to get the whole story. And the problem here is that um, some of the observations I've just gone over with you um, can be used to downplay the importance of the neurophysiological details when it comes to studying minds, right? Um, a lot of information processing, processing accounts of the mind, um, once they are developed, once they are developed and known, there is a sense in which they are independent of implementational descriptions of those systems, in a certain sense. But when it comes to the job of discovering what are the right kinds of computational or algorithmic descriptions? You know, what are the what are what are the right kinds of information processing descriptions? This job is certainly not independent of the implementational details at all. Of the, it's not independent of the implementation descriptions. So once we've done what Mar has done and come up with an information processing account of vision, that account of going from you know, a 2D sketch to a 2.5D sketch to a 3D sketch is independent of the implementational details in a certain sense. But, and we see this in Mars' own work, working out that description, uh, he, in order to do that, he had to pay attention to the implementational details. So, um, so the job of discovering, as I said before, the right kinds of computational descriptions is certainly not independent of the implementational descriptions. That is why these two approaches need to work together. And this is illustrated very clearly in Mars' own work, but it's something that we tend to forget about when we're teaching um, and you know when we're teaching about the tri-level hypothesis, right? So this is something we have to keep in mind. But why? Uh, why should these uh, co-evolve together? Why is it that our computational description cannot be independent of our implementational description? Well, one reason has to do with evolution. So let's look at that now on slide number nine. So one big reason why we need these approaches to co-evolve or work together is because of evolution, all right? Our brains, obviously, are the product of evolution. They are something that we could say was designed by evolution, right? In fact, sometimes uh, theorists do describe it this way. Daniel Dennett certainly does. He talks about evolution um, in a kind of designy way, not as an intelligent designer, uh, but as a, as a kind of uh, blind designer. This term ultimately goes uh, back to Richard Dawkins, of course. Evolution is a bit like a blind watchmaker, right? But of course, evolution doesn't design the way that a human engineer would or 
to go back to the watchmaker analogy, which is due to a theologian named William Paley. Uh, he imagines a deistic God, right, that uh, designed the universe and then just kind of let it go and let it work like a clockwork mechanism. So uh, that's a sort of uh, creationist account, right? But, uh, you know, Dawkins says, well, evolution is more like a blind watchmaker. It is more like, um, to use Jacob's terminology, it is more like a tinkerer than a human engineer. Uh, let me try and explain what I mean. So let's consider something like the lung. Uh, and this is the example um, from Clark, right? Our lungs obviously evolved from some kind of ancestor lungs from other primates, uh, which in turn evolved from the lungs of smaller uh, mammals, which in turn evolved from some common ancestor species uh, between mammals and reptiles, which in turn evolved from something else all the way back in evolutionary time to where we get to something like a fish, right? Some kind of early fish. And some of these early fish had swim bladders. And if you trace the evolution of the modern human lung far back enough, you find that it evolved from the swim bladders of these fish, which is fascinating. But the thing about this is that evolution can't make a really awesome, perfect lung. It has to work with what it's got, right? It's got to work with swim bladders and then very rudimentary lungs, uh, all the way up to lungs that we have now, which, yes, seem like intricately designed and natural machines, but they're actually kind of weird. Maybe a human engineer or some kind of watchmaker god would design a better lung from scratch, right? But evolution is constrained in a certain way. It's constrained in the sense that it can only work with what's already there. It can only work with what it's got. So it's got to come up with uh, solutions to design problems using just what it has. Like a tinkerer tinkering with something uh, that's already existent, rather than a designer designing something from scratch. So that's the sense in which evolution is more like a tinkerer. And this actually constrains the solutions to certain problems that evolution can come up with. Uh, and this, of course, uh, I'm talking about this in the context of the evolution of the mind and the brain. Now, this means that evolution might discover uh, uh, solutions to design problems that wouldn't occur to a human engineer. Um, and biological brains, as a consequence of this, might have evolved information processing strategies uh, that would seem weird to, you know, a computer scientist who's perhaps trying to build a, a robot or an artificial intelligence or something. So evolution is constrained like a tinkerer. It's not really a designer, although some people call it a blind designer, but it's really more like a tinkerer. It has to work with what it's got. And that's why evolution is kind of constrained in terms of the solutions to certain problems that it can identify, whether we're talking about uh, grasping hands or uh, strategies, information processing strategies. But even though evolution is constrained, it's also liberated in a very interesting way. Evolution can discover uh, interesting yet messy solutions to certain problems. That is to say that naturally evolved systems uh, can exploit very complicated environmental interactions, feedback loops, uh, dynamic features of the world that might baffle a human engineer because they're so complicated. So evolution um, is kind of liberated in a sense as well because it can explore a much larger solution space than that which might uh, occur to a human designer to explore. So, for these reasons, we should not ignore the implementational details or focus exclusively on information processing descriptions, because our minds are the product of evolution, and evolution um, is like a tinkerer. It's got to work with what it's got, but it can exploit weird solutions to problems that engineers wouldn't think about. Um, and that's just kind of the nature of the beast, I guess. Evolution is one of those interesting things.
So why don't we consider some examples from Clark's chapter to try to clarify this a little bit. One example concerns monkey finger motions, right? I know, very interesting. And by the way, um, if you want to learn more about this, uh, you can check out some of the boxes from this chapter, chapter, um, chapter five, yes. Uh, you can check out some of the boxes which um, kind of map out the early visual system and macaque monkeys, which are the kinds of monkeys we're talking about here. But consider monkey finger motions, right? So you're a human designer or a human cognitive scientist, and you want to understand how monkeys move their fingers. And you might hypothesize that individual fingers are controlled by individual uh, clusters of neurons that neighbor one another in area M1 uh, of the motor cortex, uh, the area that controls the hand. So um, you might think that this area of the motor, motor cortex, M1, is organized in terms of what, it is, what is called a somatotopic map, right? So this is like the engineer's solution. If you were to build a robot monkey with robot neurons or something, uh, you might have a little cluster of neurons for this finger, cluster of neurons for this finger, and so on and so forth. So you have a little cluster of neurons for each finger in the motor cortex. That seems very, um, you know, um, efficient, right, from a design standpoint. Um, and you, would, you might also think that that is the kind of thing that you would observe in the natural world, right? You might think that if I looked at the patterns of activity in the motor cortex of a macaque monkey while she's moving her fingers, I'd see a cluster of neurons for this one, cluster of neurons fire when she does this, a different cluster fire when she does this, and no activity for the fingers that aren't moving, right? Makes sense, right? Well, turns out this is not at all how it works. It turns out that in monkeys' brains, and arguably in humans' brains, because after all, we are closely related to all of the other primates, more closely related to the great apes than we are to monkeys, but our brains are similar enough that we could expect this to also plausibly be the case in human brains. But anyway, turns out what happens in monkey brains is that indi individual finger movements uh, are accompanied by an activation throughout area M1 of the motor cortex. And you're probably thinking, what the heck? Why is there activity in the entire motor cortex? Well, I'll tell you. But first, even weirder, Single-digit motions generate more activity in the area M1 of the motor cortex than entire hand movements do, like grasping motions like this. So now you're probably thinking, what the heck? That's completely different than you might have thought if you were thinking like an engineer or a designer, right? Why is this the case? Well. If we adopt the right perspective, an evolutionary perspective, it makes sense. Grasping behavior is ancestral to individual finger movements. Think about it. Our, answer, our ancestors, our apes, and the common ancestor of apes and monkeys, uh, probably lived in trees, and it probably needed to grasp branches for transportation. It needed to grasp food. Um, it needed to be able to... Uh, pick out parasites from its other uh, monkey friends. So we have this ancestral whole hand grasping motion that probably existed before this kind of motion evolved. So why do we see the kind of activity that we do in area M1 of the motor cortex for single digit um, hand motions? Well, they're more complicated and more recent. And what seems to be going on is that the default of area M1 is this kind of ancestral grasping behavior. What's going on when we move individual figure, fingers, uh, or when monkeys move individual fingers, is actually inhib inhibitory activity in the motor cortex. So when we see um, individual movements, we get more activity than when we see gra grasping motions, and that's because of the excitatory activity being inhibited uh, so that you're only moving one finger rather than closing your whole hand. So that's a weird design from a design perspective, 
but it makes sense given what evolution had to work with. Evolution had a hand, or uh, the monkey's homologue to a hand, um, that uh, could do this first, and eventually, given what it had, it had a hand that could grasp and a motor cortex that fired a certain way when it grasped. Uh, inhibitory activity evolved such that we could move one finger at a time. So, uh, again, a weird design, but one that makes sense if we look at it from the perspective of the tinkerer, that is evolution, rather than from the perspective of the designer. You might also consider perceptual adaptation as an example here. Uh, for example, um, the visual system, uh, I'm talking the visual system in humans now, can adapt to distorted visual inputs or perspective shifted visual inputs. Maybe some of you have tried this where you put on the, uh, the drunk uh, goggles, you know, they're goggles that you wear that um, distort your vision such that everything is all out of whack and you have trouble navigating your environment. It's almost like you're drunk, right? Um, there are similar glasses that uh, will flip everything upside down or uh, that will shift everything a few degrees to the right or the left. So we can wear these special perspective shifting glasses and um, they have this effect where they change our visual inputs and everything is out of whack. But after a few days of wearing these glasses, people will adapt to the new visual input. Uh, they will be able to compensate for uh, the shifted perspective. So uh, the really interesting thing here is that the compensation only occurs for specific motor actions, specific motor loops. The example given in the textbook is this, where uh, if I wear some glasses that shift everything, you know, kind of to the side a little bit, and I try to play some darts and throw darts at a dartboard, I'm going to miss that dartboard, right? Because I'm not used to this perspective. Once my brain adapts, I can hit that dartboard, right? I can maybe get a bullseye, or if not a bullseye, I can at least hit the board with my uh, right hand. But if I try and do that to my, uh, with my non-dominant hand, the compensation will not transfer. It's specific to the motor loop that I'm actually using uh, day to day wearing these perspective shifting glasses. Now this suggests that there, um, are distinct perception and action systems working here. Uh, distinct, a distinct perception system delivering information to a distinct action system. And the two systems are kind of working together. Uh, this will be like, an, we could consider it, uh, you know, the visual inputs from my eyes and the uh, motor representations for throwing objects with my dominant hand, right? Um, and these systems seem to work together in the context of specific tasks. So I could throw a dart at the dartboard. Um, I may not be able to throw a football because it's a different kind of, right? It's a different kind of throw. Perhaps this uh, adaptation won't transfer to that motor task. So um, we need to pay attention to perceptual adaptation. Uh, and why things work the way they do, because it reveals how the implementational story can inform the computational story, and vice versa. Uh, personally, I think I like the monkey hand example better than this one, but if you want to read more about this example and other examples, refer to page 97 of Mindware. All right, so now we're going to change gears a little bit and uh, look at slide 13, where Clark raises these four propositions um, that we need to consider. These propositions highlight some problems with what roboticists sometimes call the sense, think, act cycle uh, description of cognition. Or sometimes this is also called the classical sandwich, where we have inputs, computations, and outputs, right? This is basically what we do when we come up with a computational level description of something. We work out the inputs and the outputs and describe the computational task. Uh, but there are four uh, points here, again, that Clark raises on page 97 that uh, should make us question this account. And this account, I should mention, is very informed by the levels talk that um, I outlined earlier. So I'll just summarize each of these points, and then we're going to go through each of them in turn. So what are these points? Well, point number one, daily agent-environment interactions 
seem not to depend on the construction and use of composite detailed inner models of the full 3D scene. Okay. Low-level perception, this is number two, may call motor routines that yield better perceptual input and hence improve information pickup. All right. Number three, real-world actions may sometimes play an important role in the computational process itself. Very important. And finally, four, the internal representation of worldly events and structures may be less like a passive data structure or description and more like a direct recipe for action. All of these are important because they are going to uh, show, as we discuss each of them, we will see um, that sort of uh, lack of neatness uh, of Mars levels, right? We've already talked about the importance of implementational descriptions informing computational and algorithmic descriptions and vice versa. And now we're going to see a little bit about, you know, just how messy this stuff really is. Uh, we're going to see that these levels, uh, you know, aren't necessarily top down, right? We should take multiple approaches, perhaps bottom up, uh, holistic approaches where we consider implementational details um, and uh, information processing accounts at the same time. So let's go through all of these in turn and try and explain them briefly before I wrap up for the day. So proposition number one, daily agent environment interactions seem not to depend on the construction and use of a composite detailed inner model of a full 3D scene. What are some uh, lines of evidence for this? Well, um, first, before I get into that, remember this is uh, this is uh, this is a really interesting example because this is what Mar was all about, right? Uh, he was interested in what the purpose of vision was for: taking 2D inputs from the retina, going through the optic nerves to the visual system, which uh, builds a um, a viewer a viewer independent representation of, of the world. And indeed, um, this also meshes nicely with our day-to-day -day experience, right? I mean, just stop for a second and look around, and it seems like you have this rich, detailed inner model of the world. I'm looking over here at my desk right now, but it seems like my brain is still representing the bookshelf over here in the corner of my eye. Um, so it seems like I have this rich, uh, map, almost like a snapshot that I can just look around at, and it's fully detailed and everything's there. That's the way it seems, but that's not the way it is. And we know this because of a couple interesting phenomena. Change blindness and a related phenomenon called inattentional blindness. Now, um, I'm not going to get into this in too much detail. Indeed, I'm not really going to discuss the examples in the book in great detail. I'm just going to say that change blindness occurs because uh, when our eyes saccade around the room, they actually don't uh, transmit information to the brain. So let me explain what saccading is. Let's see. Uh, I need an object. Okay, so let's say this is the this is the object. It's our textbook. Now, if I look at the book, if I don't, I, I'm not going to move my head, but I'm going to keep my eyes focused on the book. If I look at the book as I move it, what my eyes are doing is called tracking or smooth pursuit, right? When I look at something and my eyes are visually fixated on it like this, they smoothly track it, okay? But when you look around the room, that's called a saccade when your eyes kind of jump from uh, my computer to the camera to the bookshelf to the lamp. That's called a saccade. When your eyes do that, information does not travel uh, to the visual cortex. But you don't have this sudden, uh, you know, it's not like everything goes dark for a second, right? When you saccade your eyes, you still have this uh, apparently rich inner model. Um, that's a trick of the brain. Um, the brain is doing that. The brain is uh, seemingly maintaining this model. But it's not even doing that good of a job at it. We know this because of change blindness. And change blindness can occur when changes to the visual scene occur during a saccade. So um, we'll do experiments where we show someone a picture and the, there's an eye tracker. And the computer is set up in such a way that when someone's eyes saccade to a different part of the image, the image actually changes to a different image with one very subtle difference. 
and people often will not notice the change. A related phenomenon is, of course, inattentional blindness, and this is when we fail to notice changes in the scene uh, because we're focused on something else and a change occurs elsewhere. Um, you may have seen examples of this, right? There's the invisible gorilla example, which is um, a staple of intro to psychology classes uh, all over the place, all the time, right? It's a basketball game, and there's a black and a white team. They've got their different colored jerseys. And you have to count the number of times that one of the team passes the basketball. And while students are counting, a man in a gorilla suit comes out and beats his chest and waves at the camera. And a lot of people don't notice the gorilla because they're counting the passes that this one basketball team is making. That's inattentional blindness. I'll uh, link you to that video, but I'm also going to link you to an even better video, which is of a magic routine. This is from the magician, uh, the magician duo Penn and Teller. They do a cup and ball routine, very classic magic trick. But the cool thing about this is not only that they exploit change blindness and inattentional blindness to accomplish the effect, uh, they also show you how they do the trick. So you can watch the trick and see a little magic. And then you can watch it again and see where they exploited change blindness and inattentional blindness using their misdirection to achieve their effect. So again, the link is down there. Magicians often do this to exploit uh, interesting uh, effects, uh, to, to, or rather to achieve interesting illusions and effects. Um, but the, the point of this, uh, of the gorilla video and uh, the Penn and Teller thing that I want to share with you are just to illustrate how, contrary to how things seem, we don't seem to maintain this detailed, rich inner snapshot of reality, right? And this is important to keep in mind. Uh, and we, we need to keep in mind, uh, you know, not just a computational description of vision here, but the implementational details and also the interface between the mind and the world. Uh, another line of evidence um, that kind of um, undermines this picture of this snapshot conception of reality, as some call it, <clears throat> actually comes from research in the new robotics or behavior-based robotics. Um, behavior-based robotics takes advantage uh, of architectures that don't maintain detailed models of the environment. Um, as Rodney Brooks said, the founder of behavior-based robotics and the inventor of the Roomba vacuum, which is a, uh, a new robot, a behavior-based robot that uses a subsumption architecture. Um, Rodney Brooks left MIT for this, by the way, so, um, you know, good, good for him. So in a behavior-based robot, we don't have a sense-think-act cycle where there's this detailed representation that central cognition operates on and generates outputs. It's not like that. Instead of sen one sense-think-act cycle, it has a whole bunch of different sense-act cycles that are kind of like reflex agents. Um, they respond directly to the world in terms of production rules or condition action rules. So um, I'll link to a video here, and you can also find this link in the slides, of uh, Herbert, the can-collecting robot, which worked this way. The video explains how Herbert works, but basically Herbert would go around the lab at MIT, and it would just kind of uh, wheel around following the wall um, until it identified something that might be a tabletop. And then another behavior would take over where it would go to the tabletop, scan it for a can. And if it found a can, it would line itself up with the can. And then an arm would come out and grab the can, right? Again, you should pause the video now and watch this video to uh, see how Herbert works. But the point is, is that Herbert did all of this without any kind of complicated inner representation of the world or central cognition. It did it using the subsumption architecture. So we have these different sense-act systems, these simple reflex agents, um, that respond directly to the environment, and when one behavior is achieved, or when one condition is satisfied, another type of behavior can take over. When Herbert finds a table, it stops and can scan the table. If it finds a can on the table, it centers itself 
uh, in front of the can, and so on and so forth. Um, all without um, uh, the construction of a composite, detailed inner model of the world, right? And this is also consistent with proposition number two. It also serves as evidence for proposition number two, which is that low-level perception may call motor routines that yield better perceptual input and improve information pickup. Sometimes this is called the interactive vision strategy, um, and it's basically a more elaborate version of uh, what I just talked about, or, or what is discussed in the short video about Herbert the robot. Um, here we've got uh, what we could think of as perceptual motor loops, um, that make the most of incoming information by combining multiple sources of information, just like the subsumption architecture does. Um, so here, um, perception isn't passive. It's not like I'm just some agent in the world and all this information is coming in and my brain just generates this uh, nice model of the world. Rather, uh, perception and action here interact in a sort of game of tag. Um, again, see the video on Herbert. Or consider a more human example. Consider something as simple as reaching for this coffee cup right here. So it might seem to you, based on your everyday experience of the world and of coffee cups and of reaching for things, that you're a passive agent and your brain has generated this wonderful, rich, three-dimensional model of the world and then, once that model is built, you initiate action, right? Ah, my brain is representing this coffee cup right here. Now that I know where the coffee cup is, I can just consciously reach out and grab it and take a sip of coffee. Now, like the monkey hand example, the way this actually works is different than the way you probably think it works. What actually happens when we engage in this kind of behavior is not that we look at the scene, form a detailed representation, form a plan for action, and then execute the plan. We are actually a lot more like Herbert, the robot. What we actually have in the human brain are two different streams for visual processing. We have a stream that helps us work uh, in space, you know, vision for action, and we have a scene for, or we have a, we have, um, we have a stream for seeing, for perception. So we have, uh, sometimes this is called a what pathway and a where pathway, or a vision for perception pathway and a vision for action pathway. The vision for perception pathway, or the what pathway, is consciously accessible. I see the coffee cup, I identify the coffee cup, I see where my arm is in space as it's reaching for the coffee cup. Cool. But that is not the visual input that is uh, allowing me to reach for the coffee cup. That is the vision for action stream or the where pathway. This is not consciously accessible. So when I'm doing this reaching motion, it seems like I'm looking consciously at where my arm is and where the cup is, and I'm using that information to consciously control my arm to reach the cup. That is not in fact what is happening. And this is illustrated by a very interesting phenomenon called blind sight where damage to the vision for perception pathway uh, means that people have no phenomenal experience of vision. Perhaps this happens in one eye, so that I, have, uh, I can't see anything from uh, this eye because my vision for perception pathway has been damaged. But because it's a separate pathway, my vision for action pathway is separate and undamaged, even though I can't consciously see the cup, I could reach out and pick it up. It's kind of like Ramachandran, the neuroscientist says. It's kind of like blindside patients have a zombie in their head. Now, um, that's weird, right? Um, that undermines a lot of what you think about what your experience of the world is really like, or what your experience of the world tells you about what your mind is like. But it's true. Um, and these two visual systems kind of interact and play a game of tag with one another when it comes to, uh, you know, reaching out uh, and picking up coffee cups or opening doors. So, um, low-level perceptual stuff here can call motor routines that might yield better perceptual input, right? I could change my view or my perspective 
uh, depending on how I'm reaching for the cup or whatever, right? Evidence for number three, real world actions may sometimes play an important role in the computational process itself. Uh, just think about depth perception here, right? Um, depth perception uh, requires having binocular vision. We need two eyes uh, on the front of our heads. Uh, and uh, this is what allows us to represent depth in our three-dimensional uh, visual representations of the world. Or you can even consider distinguishing figure from ground. You know, if you're an animal out there and you're uh, looking for uh, something to eat, right? You need to distinguish the rabbit, perhaps, from the field that the rabbit is sitting in. Uh, this can be accomplished by certain head movements, moving your head around and changing your perspective. This is probably uh, why we see head bobbing behavior in certain animals, like uh, birds that spend a lot of time on the ground, like, uh, well, pigeons fly a lot, but they hang out on the ground a lot, or chickens or ostriches, you know how they kind of do that head bobbing thing. That's helping them navigate their environment by changing their perspective constantly. Or consider the uh, STRIPS mechanism. This was the Stanford Research uh, Institute problem solver. Uh, it, was a, it was a computer program that allowed the first mobile autonomous robot, Shaky, I'll link you to something about Shaky below, to solve problems. Shaky would do things like um, moving colored blocks, like uh, spare colored blocks from one room to reproduce uh, a pattern of blocks in another room. So there's a pattern of colored blocks in one room, and there's a bunch of spare blocks, and Shaky's got to take the spare blocks and recreate that pattern in a separate room. So what does Shaky do? Well, uh, Shaky uh, forms a representation. Uh, Shaky uses the spare blocks just to copy it uh, one step at a time. And you might think that we would do something similar where we faced with uh, the same kind of task. Um, you might think that we, um, you know, form a representation in our minds and we consult it uh, as we move blocks. But um, we actually don't do it this way. We actually consult our inner models or, or our outer models too, the, the world being its own best model, before moving the blocks and after moving the blocks. It's not like we just look at the blocks and work out the thing and maintain that representation in our head and operate on it in the way that Shaky does using strips. We consult our models all the time throughout the process via real world actions, perhaps going back into the room and taking another look. Um, so we do this before moving the blocks and after having had move a block, which suggests that we only represent the color of the block or the position of a block, but not both. Uh, when it comes, at least with respecting the blocks that we're moving and copying. What about evidence for Proposition 4? Uh, this one reads, The internal representation of worldly events and structures may be less like a passive data structure or description, and more like a direct recipe for action. You can consider the work of, uh, I, I think I'm saying this right, uh, Maya Matarik, or... Uh, I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing this name, but uh, she created um, an artificial model of how rats navigated their environment. And she did this in the MIT Artificial Intelligence Lab. By the way, she was a student of Rodney Brooks. Um, so she used the subsumption architecture to do this, uh, the same architecture that Herbert the robot had. But these artificial rat models uh, could also learn things, which was the, which was the neat part of this research. And these rats in this model uh, could detect and remember uh, landmarks in their mazes via a combination of sensory input and the, the rat's current motion and its position. So it's not like it has a map in its head, these virtual rats. Rather, if the rat needs to go back to somewhere it's already been, it can remember a previous combination of sensory input and motor commands, not some passive data structure that it operates on. It rather remembers the recipe for action that it took last time it was there. So it can work its way backwards from there just by, say, reversing the action and going backwards until it's back to where it was. 
very fascinating stuff. So here, uh, again, it's not an inner richly detailed model of the world. It's a direct recipe for action. Uh, Clark calls this kind of thing uh, an action-oriented representation, and we find this a lot in, uh, you know, dynamics, in uh, the new robotics, and stuff like that. So by putting all of these together, we see that um, by paying attention to these lines of evidence, we can come up with a much more integrated account of perception, cognition, and action. That is, by paying attention not exclusively to the computational details, nor exclusively to the implementational details, but paying attention to both sides of the story and how the system we're talking about engages with the world will give us a much more integrated account of perception, action, and cognition of perception, action, and the brain. We see that perception is entangled with different possibilities for action, and that possibilities for action are entangled with perception. And we've seen that we should question the idea that we get from classical symbolic AI of some kind of central cognition operating on stable, detailed inner representations of the world. The brain, it seems, uh, isn't quite like this. It's not like a centralized engine of reason. It's more like, as Clark says on page 106, an organ of environmentally situated control. You know, we're not like brains in a vat. We're brains in bodies in a temporal, dynamic world that always changes. And our minds have evolved in that world. Our minds are perhaps not all that much like the minds designed by human computerists, uh, by human computerists. Our minds are perhaps less like the systems designed by human designers and are more like, well, or just are, systems designed by the tinkerer that is evolution. That's what our minds are like. Um, and this is something we need to pay close attention to when we try to understand how the mind works. All right, that's it for the substantive material for today. Let's wrap it up. All right, so today we've covered the sketches section of Clark, and I have glossed over certain details uh, in the book. So again, I just want to make sure that you guys are all doing okay with this material, and I want to encourage you to get in touch with me if you need help. I haven't really heard from a whole lot of you. I imagine that's because you're all busy and it is a stressful time heading into midterms. Reading week is almost here, but not quite. Um, we're in a second wave of COVID-19. And uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's been rough. So I hope you're all doing well. I hope you're all taking care of yourselves and taking care of each other. But if you need help, please don't be afraid to reach out, okay? Uh, I want to make sure you all succeed at this. So even if you don't need help, just let me know. Hey, I'm doing fine. I understand things. That would be great. I just want to know that everybody's doing okay with the material. Okay? So we have discussed uh, Mars levels of analysis, and we've discussed the influence that this levels talk has had uh, within the cognitive, science, uh, cognitive sciences. But we've also stressed the importance of paying attention to the implementational side of things and not uh, ignoring the implementational details to focus on information processing descriptions. We've talked about the importance of keeping in mind uh, evolution, right? The mind is something that has evolved, not something that, is, has, been, that has been designed. Uh, and this informs uh, how we ought to approach studying the mind. When we keep this in mind and when we consider other things like uh, the questioning of the sense-think-act picture of cognition from the new robotics and all the various lines of evidence we considered in the second half of the lecture, um, we, we see that uh, we need to uh, pay much closer attention to the, um, the implementational details, paying attention to uh, how perception, action, uh, and, and all of that is actually physically realized. Okay, so that is it for today. Uh, the next lecture will cover the discussion section from chapter 5. I imagine that lecture will be a teeny bit shorter uh, than usual, 
But then again, I say that a lot, and then the uh, then these lectures turn out to be longer than I thought they would be. So I don't know. Maybe this is all lies. Uh, the point is, um, the next lecture is on its way. We'll be covering the discussion section from Clark, as we usually do. In the meantime, take care of yourselves and each other. Study hard. Reach out to me if you have any questions, um, and stay safe. I'm going to get right to work on the next lecture uh, because, as per my announcement, I've changed things up a bit this week and I want to get this lecture done so I can finish grading your critical responses. So I'll see you soon for our next lecture. Bye for now.